Good morning, everyone. I'm Russell Myers, CEO of Midland Health. This is our coronavirus update for Monday, June 1st, 2020. We have a lot to talk about today, so uh, we'll get right into it with statistics. Across the state of Texas, we now have over 64,000 positive cases. There have been 1,672 deaths in the state of Texas. In Midland County, we've reported 129 cases uh, per the state's website, and there have been 12 deaths in Midland County. Uh, here at Midland Memorial, we continue to test at our drive-through testing site and, and via other venues. We've uh, sent away 2,805 tests total. We're still awaiting results on 164 of those, large number from last week as labs around the state have gotten much busier. Now, the oldest outstanding results we have now are from the 26th, so almost a week old now. Uh, there were two positive cases uh, over the weekend that will get reported later today and added to that number. The census here at Midland Memorial Hospital is 143 total patients. Uh, Ten of those are in critical care. Only three of that patient population are COVID positive patients now. None of those are critical. Three of them are on a medical unit. All of them are positive uh, with confirmed positive tests. Only one remaining patient from Midland Medical Lodge. Uh, emergency room traffic yesterday, 118 patients. And uh, throughout the hospital, we have four patients on ventilators this morning. Uh, throughout our hospital, we have been, uh, the, since the beginning of the COVID crisis, we have been working on properly assigning beds and units uh, to allow for the proper isolation and cohorting of the positive population. As the COVID population has gotten so small, it becomes very difficult to do that. Uh, efficient staffing requires more patients than one or two on a unit. And so uh, we're beginning to repurpose uh, our beds around the hospital, also recognizing that, that elective admissions, elective surgeries, and other procedures are continuing to ramp up. We need those beds uh, to be able to do the work that our community needs us to do, to be able to accept transfers from other communities. Uh, and so we are actively repurposing beds now. One more complicating factor in all of that is that we have construction going on on the ninth floor. Uh, we're building out the, the originally shelled unit on the top of the Scarber Tower. Uh, and that's got some uh, impact on the floors below, especially on eight, uh, as penetrations are made in the floors and we have to take a few rooms down at a time. So a lot of room um, and uh, assignment shuffling going on throughout the hospital, uh, but the declining COVID census makes it easier to manage that. Uh, and we're, we're pleased with that impact so far. Uh, we've talked a lot in the last few days about the governor's mandate that all nursing home uh, residents and staff be tested. Uh, we, we've said and, and have continued to cooperate with the, the Midland Fire and EMS Service, with the Midland Health Department, with the nursing homes themselves. Uh, and our staff have provided uh, training uh, in the use of personal protective equipment in the sampling technique. Uh, we've, we've been to nursing homes and helped them assess their facilities for the proper isolation locations. And that cooperative effort has gone very well so far. The challenge we ran into last week, which, which remains unsolved at this point, is that the state labs have become um, really overwhelmed by the volume of nursing home testing that's going on all over the state. Uh, our initial inclination to send all of the local tests to the Lubbock State Lab uh, has not worked out. And so we're continuing to, to work with our contacts at the state and with our friends uh, in uh, the Midland Health Department and Midland Fire Department uh, to determine what the best course of action to complete the nursing home testing is going to be. At this point, we don't have a clear plan going forward, uh, but with a lot of cooperation that's that's been exhibited here locally, as soon as we get some guidance from the state, uh, we'll be able to wrap up this project. Uh, I think it's, it's very likely that it will require uh, more state involvement going forward uh, due to the challenges with getting labs that have access to uh, the capacity to actually run the tests. Uh, but that will play out in the next few days, and, and uh, we'll let you know when there's more to be shared along those lines. Uh, I told you that ramping up elective procedures has been going on now for, for several weeks. Uh, we are essentially wide open now for the scheduling of elective procedures. 
uh, in all facets of the operation, uh, in endoscopy, in the cardiac cath lab, in the heart surgery environment, uh, in our regular operating rooms. Uh, we are still relieving backlogs. Uh, many of our surgeons have had a number of patients they've put off and are working through those backlogs. Uh, and as we'll continue to monitor that, we uh, absolutely have a continuing obligation to be ready to take care of COVID patients as they arise. Uh, and so we want to be thoughtful day to day as we uh, provide surgical procedures, as we uh, hospitalize some of those patients uh, who require inpatient stays. We want to be sure we have adequate capacity available uh, for whatever else may arise. So that's largely good news. Uh, more good news, also somewhat related to the increase in, in surgery and procedure volume. We are adjusting our visitation limits. Uh, now, you know, for, for several weeks, we've been working on severely limited visitation. Uh, most patients have not been able to have a visitor at all. Uh, pediatric patients and adult patients who need someone to speak for them uh, and patients at the end of life have been uh, allowed a visitor, but hardly anyone else. Uh, we're opening that much wider uh, today, effective today. Uh, every patient, inpatient or outpatient, may have one support person come with them and accompany them uh, to their, their room, to their testing site, to, to whatever location they need to be um, uh, going in the hospital. Uh, in pediatrics, we're allowing both parents uh, to be with an inpatient pediatric patient. Uh, in labor and delivery, we have been allowing one support person throughout the labor and delivery process. We're upping that to two. Uh, there have been some concerns expressed by a few patients with regard to the presence of their doula, uh, which is a, a, a labor uh, helper and advisor, uh, along with a supportive person from the family, the father of the child or someone else. So going forward, uh, we will allow two support persons in labor and delivery, uh, which can include the doula. We're still not allowing visitors under the age of 18. Uh, we think that's going to continue to be important for a while yet. So children are not allowed to visit uh, in the hospital environment uh, at this point. And every visitor, every patient, every visitor, every staff member who comes into our doors is expected to wear a face covering when they're around other people. Uh, that, that can be a mask like the one that I, that I wear every day. Uh, it can be any other type of covering of the nose and mouth. Uh, but while among other people throughout the hospital, throughout the time that they're here, uh, we expect anyone who's in our facilities to wear a face covering. A patient alone in his or her room, a, a staff member working alone in an office, those are about the only folks who are not wearing face coverings at this point. We think that continues to be important to avoid further spread of the virus. We're, we're excited about the return of some volunteers. We were working on that last week. Uh, I think you probably know that our volunteer workforce uh, tends to be among the more senior people in the hospital, uh, but there are some who are under the age of 65, and we've talked to, to many of them about their interest in returning to, to some duty within the hospital. We also have a junior volunteer population uh, that, that typically ramps up during the summer, and we'll be allowing some of the junior volunteers uh, to be here as well. Uh, all that will be developing over the next few days, but we're very excited about the return of at least a portion of our volunteer auxiliary workforce. Good news on personal protective equipment. Uh, we, between the uh, decreasing volume of COVID patients and the slight improvements we've seen in the supply chain, uh, we're going back to more traditional use of personal protective equipment, the N95 respirator mask, uh, we have been reusing for up to four shifts. We even for a while were reprocessing those and decontaminating and, and cleaning them. Uh, at this point, we've moved now to a single shift use. Uh, so our employees will be asked to keep their N95 mask just for the shift they're working, uh, discard it at the end of the shift and get a new one when they come back. Uh, isolation gowns, which we had also been reusing, uh, that was one of the hardest things for us to get. Uh, for a while there, we've returned now to single use for isolation gowns, uh, and that's, that's another positive development as the supply chain improves. Uh, throughout the facility, uh, we're also returning to more routine operations. Our COVID patients have, have uh, had all of their services done by nursing staff for an extended period of time. We're now returning dietary staff and housekeepers 
uh, and others who need to be in those patients' rooms to their regular duties uh, as long as they wear appropriate PPE. Uh, that is also starting today. Uh, that will help relieve the challenges that our nursing staff have faced with having adequate uh, staff uh, throughout the house as we get uh, busier. We have continuing concerns really just about one item of personal protective equipment and that is gloves. Uh, we're looking for multiple different source possibilities for, for gloves, especially in smaller sizes, which tend to be worn by many of our nursing staff. Uh, and so we're, we're actively looking to source gloves in other areas. We have enough gloves to do, to do our work day to day. We're just worried about the supply uh, being adequate in the long term. Finally, there's a lot of talk about remdesivir, uh, the, the new drug that has been shown to uh, at least decrease the duration of, of severe illness from some COVID patients. Uh, we have been fortunate to be assigned 160 vials of remdesivir that has all been received here at Midland Memorial. Uh, that's the capacity to treat uh, somewhere between 14 and 26 patients. The treatment regimen varies uh, from five to 10 vials per patient or, or, or thereabouts. Uh, we have treated one patient so far on a five-day course of treatment. The patient did pretty well, uh, got off the ventilator, is still in the hospital, but has been transferred to a medical unit. So, so some good news there. Too soon to know really if it's, if it, uh, can the, the results can be assigned to the remdesivir treatment or, or other possibilities uh, uh, during the course of that patient's stay, uh, but a good sign uh, regardless. We're also cooperating with the hospitals in Odessa. Uh, <clears throat> we, we understood early on that Medical Center might be getting a shipment. We don't know if that ever happened. Uh, Odessa Regional did not, and so we've, we've been in constant communication uh, among our pharmacy leads with those facilities. We have shared uh, 18 vials with Odessa Regional over this past weekend. Uh, we understand they've had a patient that, that needed it. And as things go along, we expect to continue to do that, to cooperate with our, our associates here locally. Uh, they would do the same for us uh, because of the, the relatively random distribution of the drug and the limited supply that's available across the country. We think it's very important to cooperate with, with hospitals near us uh, who have patients for whom the drug is indicated. Uh, if we have a supply and they don't, we, we certainly intend to cooperate and share and would hope they would do the same and, and trust that they would do the same for us if we were in need. Uh, that is the, the working relationship we have among the hospitals locally. That's not new. Uh, but I think it's very important for the health of the larger community and region that we continue to cooperate with each other wherever we can. So we expect to do that. I have done so, so far. Still have a good bit of remdesivir available uh, should patients who meet indications uh, come up in any of the hospitals around us, uh, either here or elsewhere, we'll be happy to share. So that was a, a good bit of updates uh, for, for one morning, but uh, all the marks that I have for now. Uh, so I'll be happy to take questions. We have a question from Facebook. Do we have or can we get numbers of those antibody tested and how many turned out positive and how many were negative? We've done in the neighborhood of 300 tests so far, and only 10 of them have been positive for the antibodies. antibodies. Now, that's tests that have been done through the hospital's lab uh, you know, on either the West Campus or, or Main Campus draw stations. We don't have access to information about what testing others might have done around the community. But from, from our perspective, about 300, only about 10 with positive antibodies. We have a question from Sammy. Sammy, go ahead. There you guys. Good morning. Um, glad to hear that you don't have as many COVID-19 patients right now. Um, okay, I am curious. We're seeing a lot of demonstrations and protests around the country and then, you know, here last night. How does it make you feel seeing large groups of crowds that aren't practicing social distancing? Some of them don't have masks. Does this worry you that we could see a spike in COVID-19 cases? Um, just what are your thoughts on that as medical professionals? Yeah, I think you've seen, you probably have seen some things written about that. I, I would think that there is some heightened anxiety uh, among our team as we see people gather in, in large groups that are, are 
not masked and not practicing social distancing, uh, I think there's some ad, ad, advantage to the fact that they're happening outside, uh, which which mitigates that somewhat. Uh, but yeah, it's it's not ideal. Uh, certainly, we we understand the the anxiety and the concerns that are being expressed in these protests and. Uh, that certainly wouldn't wouldn't question anyone's right to protest and to gather, but uh, it does make so, make us a little anxious to see people gathering in large groups close together without masks. No question. Great, thank you. We have a question from Caitlin from the MRT. Will visitors still be screened before they are allowed in the hospital? Yes, we uh, we remain uh, closed down to only one entrance point for visitors. That's the emergency department entrance on the east end of the north side of, of the Scarborough Tower. Um, that's the west end, sorry, the west end of the north side of the Scarborough Tower. Um, we are, uh, we have stopped screening patients in our other buildings, uh, the Craddock Medical Office Building, the West Campus, the Legends Park Office Building. The screening processes at the front doors of those facilities have, uh, have been uh, discontinued. Uh, because those are not hospitals. Uh, each of the offices or, or outpatient facilities in those buildings has its own screening mechanism for the patients that come to that facility. But here in the hospital, uh, a visitor uh, must come through the emergency department entrance, must be screened, is expected to wear a face covering when they come in. If they, report, if they have a fever or they report uh, <clears throat> any exposure uh, to a COVID-19 patient, we will not allow them to come in. That will continue. Uh, and we expect it to continue for a while now. We have a question from Jacob. Jacob, go ahead. Hi, yes, yeah, just to go off of what Sammy had said, what recommendations would you give for people who do want to protest uh, in terms of keeping themselves in safe uh, while they are protesting in you know, large groups with not a lot of social distancing? Well, that's the recommendation. Uh, achieve more social distancing and, and wear a mask, uh, wear a face covering. Uh, that's an important part of minimizing the spread of the virus. Um, clearly, as long as they're outside, it helps somewhat. There's a great deal more air to diffuse the particles. Uh, but still, if you, uh, if you can social distance, then do so. Uh, if, if it's difficult to do that, then by all means, please wear a face covering. That's, that's the best advice we can offer. We have a question, <clears throat> excuse me, a question from Facebook. For LND, does it mean that one grandparent could come in to see the baby after the birth in addition to having daddy already there? It does not mean that. Uh, labor and delivery is, an is a procedural environment. So when the patient is in labor or when the delivery process is ongoing, then they may have two people supporting them. Um, the father and a doula, or the father and the grandmother, or two two people who are there for support. Once once the delivery has occurred, uh, and the patient, uh, we we now have two inpatients, uh, an inpatient baby and and a mom. Uh, then we revert to our one visitor per patient um, limitations. So uh, the the two persons is only during the labor and delivery process. Uh, that's important to recognize. Now those who the people are who, who are attendant with the mother during labor delivery is up to the mother. Um, she can decide uh, who she wants to have with her. Uh, we won't be involved in that decision making, but there will only be two. I have another question from Facebook. Why are we not informed where a positive result patient has been when it is known to be community related? Well, I think that's a question for the health department. The hospital's role um, in, in this process is caring for patients uh, as they come to us with, with positive or, or suspected disease. Uh, we are not involved in the process of contact tracing uh, or investigation of the source of the disease. That's, that's the work of the health department. Uh, we've supported them in every way that we can and we will continue to do so. We have a very good cooperative relationship with the health department, but that question really should be directed to them. We have another question on Facebook regarding the visitation policy. Um, and I believe it's for clarification on can people come visit patients outside of being that support person? That support person is the only visitor that the patient can have. So if, if, uh, 
if your mother is in the hospital, um, one, one member of the family can come and visit uh, that patient, period. Uh, not one at a time. Uh, under extraordinary circumstances, we, we will talk about, about doing something else, swapping out the support person, or perhaps having um, a little bit more access for, for a person who's at the point of dying. And we've been doing that from the beginning and we'll continue to do that. But for a, a typical inpatient, it is one support person, period. We have a question from Sammy. Sammy, go ahead. Thanks. I just wanted to go over what's the construction that's being done at the hospital? Okay, that's a good question. I'm happy to answer. Um, if you all will recall, when we built the Scarborough Tower, um, which has now been quite a while ago, we opened the Scarborough Tower in 2012, uh, it included two areas that were shelled, that were not finished out at the time. The first of those was, was on the fourth floor where we had uh, space prepared for a neonatal ICU. Uh, that's beautiful new space. It's open and working uh, as of uh, the last few months. Um, now the last of the shelled spaces is the ninth floor. The very top floor of the building was never built out. It was left shelled. Uh, we were blessed earlier this year to receive grants uh, first from the FMH Foundation uh, to build out that floor to use it for our day surgery population and those patients receiving outpatient medical treatment. Uh, both of those patient populations are now cared for in our oldest buildings uh, in uh, environments that are just not up to the standard of the Scarborough Tower. And so we're really fortunate to be able to build that space out uh, to give a better uh, treatment environment for those outpatients here for surgery or, or medical treatment. Uh, along the way, as the COVID pandemic developed, uh, we began talking to other foundations locally, uh, and the Scarborough Foundation stepped up uh, and provided additional funding for the build out of that unit to accelerate the time frame to build it out, uh, to change the design a little bit so that it can be used uh, in a as needed for uh, critical care or other inpatient environments. If we if we find ourselves overrun uh, in this pandemic or another one and need more beds, uh, we can repurpose day surgery space into uh, long-term inpatient medical or even critical care space uh, with some design modifications and some additional equipment. So grants from FMH and Scarborough Foundation are allowing us to build out the ninth floor of the Scarborough Tower. We're hopeful that that project, we're confident it will be done by the end of the year. Uh, we're hopeful that it will be done by uh, September, October timeframe uh, this fall uh, so that, you know, number one, we're ready to, to provide better accommodations for our outpatients. But should we have a return spike in the pandemic uh, or uh, some other increase in inpatient uh, needs, we'll be ready to respond to those even better than we did this first time around. Uh, you talked about the NICU unit that, I mean, opened right before all of this COVID stuff picked up. Um, how is that going, the new NICU unit and the new technology there and just having a bigger space? It's going very well. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an adjustment. We had this, uh, this patient population and staffed, staff uh, shoved into some very tiny space that was very equipment intensive and, and the ability to spread out uh, have modern new accommodations, uh, have more space for, for the parents uh, is, is a big positive. And, and we're very excited about having, having that uh, facility available. And I'll, I'll remind you, given the opportunity, that that was 100% funded by donations from the very generous folks in our community. So we're, we're really pleased with it so far and, and looking forward. Uh, I hope within, I don't think it'll be by the end of the year, but, but within a few months, to uh, get recertified by the state and move that unit to level three status. Uh, we moved into it with our existing level two special care nursery status intact, uh, but we're slowly increasing the acuity of the patient population. Uh, and within a few months, we'll apply for a certification as a level three nursery. Has COVID-19 slowed down that certification to become level three? Because I know you guys are eager to get that. Uh, I don't know that it's really slowed it down some. It kind of slows down everything we're doing because we're focused so much on the COVID right. crisis. But, but you know, it, it might have it might have cost us a month or two. But I don't know that it's it's had a material impact. 
uh, it's kind of a segregated population and, and not too much impacted by, by what's going on around us. Uh, so I don't, I don't think we've cost ourselves very much time, uh, if any, due to the pandemic. All right, awesome. Thanks, you guys. Thanks, Tammy. We have a question from Facebook regarding the visitation policy. Okay. Um, the one person, the one support person that you can have, can they spend the night in the same room with the patient? We, we have said from uh, at the beginning of this that the pediatric patient's uh, parent, one parent, can spend the night. Uh, that's a blanket rule we will allow. Uh, with regard to other patients, we're going to do those case by case. Uh, the, the patient uh, and the family member and the nursing staff on the unit will, will confer and determine whether it's appropriate for a family member to spend the night or not. As a general, general rule, we're closing visiting hours at 8, 8 p.m. every night, and that means all the visitors will, will be asked to leave um, except pediatric patient, one parent, and uh, anybody who's been given permission to stay overnight after consultation with the nursing staff. Uh, we'll, we'll continue to look at that and see how it works uh, in these next few weeks, but, but starting out, we're, we're not going to give a blanket authorization to people to spend the night, uh, but we will handle those case by case. It looks like that's all the questions we have for today. Very good. I appreciate your, your time and attention. Uh, at this point, I do not intend to schedule uh, another coronavirus update like this one. Uh, as things develop and the, the need arises, we will certainly notify the press uh, and come back and, and speak to you again. But, but as of now, there'll be no further scheduled ones. We'll just do them as needed. So thank you all for your attention throughout this process. Uh, I appreciate your support. Uh, and that's all for today. Thanks.